Warning, the following video utilizes copyright fair use notice Title 17 U.S. Code sections 107 through 118 of the copyright law. All media in this video is used for the purpose of review and commentary under the terms of fair use. All footage, music, and images used belong to their respective copyright holders. Hello everyone, I'm Bionic Slime, your online voice for reviews of your choice, and welcome to BS Reviews. Now, unlike most reviewers, I don't review anime that comes fresh off of Japan's programming block. I stick to reviewing dubbed anime whenever I feel a legitimate urge to actually review a certain anime, TV show, or movie. While I admit this is a much slower approach that probably leaves my methods to be a bit dated since I review things that many people have already long since reviewed. But I don't feel the need to force out a review unless I feel the genuine desire to want to review something. Now, I bring this up because today's review is of a very well-known and very well-loved anime series that many people have already talked about before. And I myself have been asked to review it many, many times. Well, I always say, better late than never. I'm finally taking a look at Bacano. Originally featuring only 13 episodes when it first aired, Bacano received an additional three episodes when it was released on DVD. Bacano was dubbed and released by Funimation Entertainment and created by manga author Ryogo Narita. The series was directed by Takahiro Omori, who also directed Hyper Police, I love that show, and Drara. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's my best crack at it. The animation was handled by Akira Ito who also worked on Drara, as well as Elfin Lead. Stars the dub cast of Caitlin Glass as Miria Harvent, J. Michael Tatum as Isaac Dean, R. Bruce Elliott as Zillard Quates, Sean Hennigan as Miza Avaro, and Todd Havercorn as Firo Prochesnio. The plot of Bacano. The story of Bacano is actually several different stories of several different characters taking place over several different years, ranging from the 1700s to the 1930s and even beyond that. All of these characters and events are tied and connected to each other by a secret elixir that will grant anyone who drinks it the power of immortality, creating a mad scramble for the formula's secrets amongst gangsters, alchemists, thieves, and numerous others over the course of a story that spans over 200 years told in the most erratic and unusual chronological fashion. Review of the Plot Trying to review the plot of Bacano is like trying to explain the plot of Bacano to someone. It's a gigantic pain in the ass. It's kind of a weird way that they approach the story. It jumps around a lot, and there's so many years in between because it deals with immortality that things are kind of erratic and, you know, scattered. The simplest way I can explain this whole timeline jumping story thing is to ask you to imagine what would happen if Quentin Tarantino directed an anime series with some immortality stuff mixed in at the last second. That's honestly the best way I can describe the show. It has all the markings of a Tarantino film. It's set in an older time period, the dialogue is so heavy it's spine-breaking, the story jumps around days and years without warning, and the violence comes crashing in like a blood-soaked cream pie to the face. Same. You think you're so smart! This unique narrative structure is simultaneously brilliant as well as baffling. The story follows the lives of multiple characters over the course of 200 years, following the original group of immortals, a new group of immortals, and other non-immortals who are here to make the cast more annoyingly overcrowded. 
Jumping from time to time is vaguely helped by revealing dates and circling the story around three specific key events. One is a boat carrying the original immortals from the 1700s, the hunt for the thug known as Dallas Genoa, and a massacre aboard a train called the Flying Pussyfoot, which I am pretty sure was named that just for the sake of having characters try and say the words Flying Pussyfoot with a straight face. The Flying Pussyfoot. The Flying Pussyfoot. The Flying Pussyfoot. Wasn't Rachel aboard the Flying Pussyfoot? <laughs> Good night, everybody. If it wasn't for the whole immortality gimmick, this would be what you'd call a straight up normal anime about old timey crooks and gangsters and for the most part the show does play the immortality angle like a subplot rather than the main focus so if you like a lot of people talking with ancient accents from an era that appeals only to senior citizens and young people with the tastes of senior citizens then this show is definitely for you me personally i never cared for this kind of style and setting the clothes, the accents, the music, none of it clicks with me, and it never will. I know some people do have a taste for this sort of media, so please don't let my disinterest in this time period lead you to think I would outright dislike this anime. I truly admire the series' ability to juggle so many characters, events, and they manage to make them all connect and circle around larger incidents like the whole flying pussyfoot train thing and the mob war. This is also one of those series that you're going to have to watch multiple times in order to fully understand everything. There is just too much going on to soak it up on your first viewing. One thing that is particularly strange about this series is the unusually easy acceptance everyone has when it comes to being immortal. Usually, stories dealing with immortality causes people to go insane from the fact that they're going to outlive everyone. Yeah! longing for death but knowing they can never achieve it, and ultimately viewing the immortal blessing as an eternal curse. But for some reason, in this series, everyone is very freaking mellow about it. They don't seem to care or think much of it. There's actually even a scene where the character Miza expresses sadness to hear that all of his modern-age friends are going to live forever after drinking some immortality juice, but they act like they couldn't give two shits about it, and well... That's it! The most elusive and sought-after mystical power that humanity has desired to achieve, and these jackasses act like it's a hangover they'll bounce back from tomorrow. I don't know if that's considered enlightening or just half-assed writing. There's a lot of serious material that's being handled with a very cavalier attitude. Sometimes this is a bad thing, as it makes it difficult to ascertain the mood that the show is going for, serious or comedic. Even the most gruesome of scenes can be played up for comedic effect, and it can kind of come off awkward or just plain weird sometimes. However, this can also be seen as a good thing, as it means the show is unpredictable. More than half of the cast are absolutely wacko, with no rhyme or reason as to why they do or say the things they do. It's funny, then it's sad, then it's scary, then it's weird, then sappy, then wild. No matter what this show throws at you, it's all part of one ridiculously crazy story that covers 200 years and a shitload of characters all over an absurdly short amount of episodes. Review of the Characters if there's one thing that Bakano is 100% crystal clear about, it's that it is all about the characters. This is the only series I've seen where it uses both its opening and its ending sequences as a glorified head counting system. The intro doesn't even have time to actually show you any images to give you an idea of what the series is about, because it's too busy shoveling all the names and faces you're going to have to keep track of. Now, I personally am a big lover of ensemble shows, like NBC's Heroes and Fox's X-Men movies. It's a difficult feat for any director to handle, so it's easy to see how quickly this kind of setup could fail, and it has many times before. Bacchino succeeds with its ensemble attempt, half of the time, 
And the rest, well, to be honest, they kind of fall flat on their immortal dumbasses. But then again, that's kind of the curse with any ensemble show, as I just mentioned. If you follow the show's intro headcount, a whopping 16 different characters are introduced. Technically, it's 17, but I kind of count Miria and Isaac as one single character for reasons I will explain shortly. Of those 16, there are only six characters that I personally find to be actually interesting and worth following. Isaac and Miria, Lad Russo, Miza, Nice, Zillard, and Ennis. The rest are mostly cliche characters given very little development or personalities to work with, like Firo and Shane, or their worthless characters who barely say or do jack shit, like Lua and the entire Gandor family, and that's not even counting the additional characters featured in the ending sequence that weren't introduced in the intro, most of which get way more development than some of the main cast does, like the Rail Tracer and Graham Specter. And please, don't even get me started on those waste of space characters, the guy and the girl from the opening and the ending of the show. Seriously. What the hell was the point of these characters existing in the first place? They are the definition of worthless. They serve absolutely no purpose in this entire anime series. I've seen pot-smoking dipshits who got hacked to pieces by Jason Voorhees serve more meaningful roles than these two losers. Now, the biggest problem with ensemble shows is that there is hardly enough screen time to go around for every character. More characters means less time to focus on certain characters, and as a result, somebody always gets the short end of the stick. For the most part, though, the right people get the right amount of playtime to keep the good times rolling. Lad Russo, for example, is completely batshit, banana balls crazy, and is unlike any other madman I've ever seen in anime. No matter how many times he appears, you never know what he's going to say or do next. He's violent, he never shuts up, and 90% of what he says doesn't make a damn bit of sense. But that's what makes him such a morbidly fascinating character. <laughs> I cannot wait to meet the genius responsible for this masterpiece! I hope it's someone incredibly handsome and just a little bit fat and absolutely sick! Don't ever be killed! Because then there's me. I'll tap this on the head like I'm goddamn Bojangles! Thank you! Fuck you! The star is here! What? No gods? Now what kind of fun is that? Liza and Zillard can arguably be seen as the main hero and villain of this series. They are, after all, the ones that started this whole immortal quest in the first place. And learning their history evolve over the course of 200 years actually makes them more compelling and necessary to the core of the story. They're like two sides of the same coin both a part of the same structure, both treasuring the immortal gift they have been given, but both wanted to use it in very different ways that neither one can understand, and yet they still remain connected. Ennis is also interesting because despite the fact that she's not human, she values and appreciates the kindness and compassion others have shown her like a blessing from God, and I think that's really interesting. We don't focus on her monster identity crisis like most inhuman characters do, and instead focus on what she treasures and values. And that's actually a great deal of development for a character that is mostly quiet and somber throughout the whole series. But if there is one thing that fans universally agree on, it's this. Isaac and Miria are not only the greatest characters in the series, but they are some of the greatest characters in anime history. These two are absolutely indescribable. They are so unimaginably clever and odd that they alone are worth watching the series for. Their enthusiasm and warped sense of fun captivate your attention every time they appear on screen. They are the only people stupid and crazy enough to perfectly understand how their stupid and crazy brains work. Even in a show full of immortals and blood-soaked assassins, Isaac and Miria are the ones that really stand out. They are too funny for words and too good to be contained in this series alone. If there were ever any characters in anime history that needed a spin-off show of their own, it would be these two. 
Cows are herbivores, aren't they? Yep. I knew it. So that means when you eat beef, you're actually eating both meat and vegetables. Isaac, you are so smart. Aren't I? From the time we started our little robbery tour, we've done 87 jobs from San Francisco to New Jersey. All of them have been interesting challenges. But have I ever once come close to putting your life in any kind of danger? Only 87 times. My point exactly, love. It's still less than 100. Oh, yeah. I will also say that with the characters who I do find annoying, like Jacuzzi Splot, also I like to point out, I'd like to know what brain damaged ass clown thought that retarded name up. The characters all have very rich backstories that sometimes say much more about them than even their personalities do. Everyone contributes to the show's entertainment factor in some way, offering a new perspective or a new dark secret that changes how you think of that character and their situation completely. And not many shows can actually do that, you know, make proper use out of everyone and make everyone feel like they are vital to the show and they couldn't go on without them. It's an impressive accomplishment considering the series is so short and the cast is so staggeringly large. You almost have to watch the series yourself just to see how they pull this all together. Review of the animation and music. The best way I can describe Bacchano's animation style is with two words. Slick and jagged. The style has a rich, fluid movement that allows the characters full mobility to do whatever they want wherever they are. This is especially noticeable in the gooey, fleshy rewind system the immortals use to pull their splattered asses back into one piece. It's like watching kill scenes from a slasher movie, but in reverse. I love how the blending of old-timey clothing possesses a sense of visual vibrancy that brings life to a period usually seen as drab and dull. It's a period piece without the pulse of one. It still feels sharp, lively, and energetic, and I was not expecting that when I saw this for the first time. Ultra-level violence is another element that makes good use of the animation's visual flair. I haven't seen blood splatters like Bacchano does them. Each character is designed in a way that they all share some traces of the animator's personal style, and yet, they retain enough individuality that you could never mistake one for another. Firo and Ennis, for example, have similar hairstyles, but they're molded and styled differently enough to give them enough differentiation. Same with, say, Miria and Nice. Both are blondes, but the color, the texture design, and the shading for their hairs are still quite different. I love any art style that does not rely on the same character molds, like Akira, for instance, and it's especially important when you're juggling so many faces and wanting each one to stand out on their own. The music is, eh, you know, I'm probably going to get flack for saying this, but I'm indifferent to the music. I really couldn't care any more or any less about it. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's just, I don't care for the style, this age of music. I have no taste or interest in it, and I really can't say if it's good or bad. I mean, it does seem like it fits the feel of the show, but would I ever want to listen to it being blasted through my stereo or computer speakers? Highly unlikely. The opening theme barely even registers with me. I will say, though, that the ending theme song, Calling, is hauntingly beautiful. And for those that recall, I even put it on my top 12 favorite anime ending themes video. I admit, I am not the best judge for this show's music, so please don't assume I am outright bashing it because of my preference. I admit my bias, and that I will never be able to feel anything for this kind of music other than... Intense, burning indifference! Flaws about the show. Bakano is one of those shows that almost everyone will recommend you to see, whether you're a veteran of anime or somebody who just recently got into it. However, I personally feel people praise this show so much that they tend to overlook or outright ignore glaring imperfections that do exist. For instance, the show has way too much information to offer and barely manages to scratch the surface of its potential due to its extremely short running time. 
There are lots of great shows that get cut down before they can finish telling their story, like Dead Man Wonderland or High School of the Dead. The problem that specifically lies with Bacchano is it tries to cram too much information into one series, and it doesn't give you a chance to really process everything because they're trying to shove 100 episodes worth of story material and character development into just 16 episodes. Do the math. The timeline covers 200 years of history. There are 16 episodes that follow over 20 different main characters over the course of 25 minute long episodes. That's 200 times 16 plus 20 divided by 25 equals moron! Don't get me wrong. It's really impressive to see so much material being dished out in each episode. But it is just too much. There's too much going on and not nearly enough time to cover it all. It's like trying to finish a test when you got one minute left. Everything gets rushed, fractured, and crammed together in a panicky mess, and you just want to finish the damn thing, even if it doesn't come out right. Maybe one way they could free up some more time is if the characters would just... Shut the fuck up, okay? Shut the fuck up! Seriously. My god, these characters do not freaking shut up. They make Deadpool look like a mute by comparison. This is another reason why I said the show is like a Tarantino movie. These characters, for the most part, have really profound, interesting philosophical shit to say. Then they go on and on and on and on. You're the type of guy who when he sees a kid come and told him with the rock, will let the little bastard live just because you feel sorry for him. To think for a minute there, I was actually afraid of you. You're just a weakling who can't go all the way. So what if I'd spare him? Huh? To my mind, it's the certainty in myself that I possess which allows me to have that kind of mercy or compassion. There's no wavering on that point. It's fixed like the stars. The fact is, I'm never gonna be killed. So remember this. Mercy and compassion are virtues that only the strong are privileged to possess. The two of you are nothing more than ghosts in my head. You can't prove to me you exist outside my mind. I am the absolute center of this world, its creator. I have no idea what will happen to it if I die. I guess I don't have a good imagination. I've tried, but I can't imagine what it would be like if I were gone. What I'm saying is, it's impossible for this world to disappear completely. But if I die, everyone else but me would simply vanish. I would be all who remains in this world once I'm gone. If you ramble on too long, even well-written dialogue can overstay its welcome. But it usually comes at the most inopportune times, like fighting to death on top of a speeding train, or preparing an army of thugs to hold people hostage at gunpoint. We got tense scenes full of conflict and life and death situations here, and these jabbering jackasses have to stop everything while they start monologuing some epically prepared speech that's as long as all three Lord of the Rings movies combined. Not every situation requires you to break out into a monologue, so why not save some time by shutting up? so that the show can actually go somewhere. Shut up and get to the point! Another problem I had with the show was the constant build-up and discussion of the character Dallas Genoa. Half the show builds him up like he's this Arctic Covenant level of importance, and when we see him, we find out he's just some generic dickbag who pissed off a lot of people and has some immortality juice in him. I get that crime families are restless when it comes to hunting down their enemies, and the fact that Dallas is the most publicly known immortal due to his brazenness, but he's just not that interesting or important to waste so much screen time and focus on. The show is bursting at the seams with interesting characters, and the most generic run-of-the-mill assholes takes up a large portion of the dialogue's focus. Even his quote-unquote final fate just makes his focus feel all the more pointless and wasted. But the biggest problem I saw was the severe lack of any explanation for how this all started. The story dictates that everything involving this immortality thing began in 1711 when a group of people went out to sea to summon a demon and that's it. That is freaking it. The most vital moment in the show's history and we're starting 45 minutes late into it. First off, 
Why the hell did they go on the boat in the middle of the ocean to summon a demon? What is the point of going out in the water to summon him? Was that part of the ritual specifics or something? How do you even charter a boat for that? Do you just book a whole crew just for the sake of going out to summon a demon? Did everyone seriously just go along knowing and believing they were going to summon a demon? Secondly, why did they summon a demon? Were they that bored? Was there no shuffleboard or bingo games to play on board? And if you try to say they all did this just to become immortal, I have to ask, how the hell do they know they were going to get that for sure? They could have summoned any number of things with their ritual. Demon raising isn't exactly something that is known to go according to plan. How do they know the thing they summoned was going to give them exactly what they wanted? Everything about this just sounds like it shouldn't have worked, and yet they conveniently get the one demon who gives them exactly what they wanted, no questions asked, no strings pulled, just gave them immortality without any consequences. This just sounds like a lot of big assholes that just gets glossed over, which is a shitty way to tell an origin story. I probably sound like I'm nitpicking here, but you just cannot ignore this. There are way too many questions left hanging with this sloppy explanation. I can believe immortals exist in this universe. I can believe a homunculus can exist in this universe. I can even believe demons can be summoned and grant people powers. But... Just like Charlie Theron's stupefying inability to dodge the most dodgeable thing in existence, I cannot believe stupid behavior without an explanation. You're telling me that all these people believed in demons, found each other, believed they could summon a demon, get immortality from said demon, got a boat, and went out to the middle of the ocean to try something that more than half the population of the planet would have regarded as total insanity? I'm sorry, I'm allergic to bullshit. Even if I were to accept that, even that wouldn't make much sense because Zillard Quates openly states many times that he didn't believe the demon was real or that he could grant them eternal life. If these people all believed in this so much they went out to the ocean to try this, why was there a guy who didn't believe it at all right there? Why was Zillard present? What was the point of him being there if he didn't believe in what they were trying to do? Was he just along for the ride? Was he someone's grandpa who was just there because they wanted to make him feel more involved? Did he fall asleep on the boat and just started living there like a hobo? And before anyone tells me it's all explained in the manga, don't bother. It is completely irrelevant. I am talking about what is, or rather, what is not being explained in the anime series. It doesn't matter in the least bit what the manga says. I am critiquing the anime series his poor means of explaining pertinent information, and whether that information is explained or not in the manga does not, nor will it ever, fill or justify the obvious gaps in the anime's narrative. Bakano doesn't give any motivation for why this whole immortality hunt started, and all the answers hidden in the manga won't change the fact the anime dropped the ball. Final wrap-up. Bakano manages to do in 16 episodes what most series never could do with 500 episodes. They accumulate grossly large amounts of rich storytelling, unforgettable characters, and presents everything in a story that is exploding with more talent and information than even its own narrative can process. There are so many things to see, people to analyze, questions to ask, that you almost have to buy it and watch it to fully appreciate what kind of epic tale is being told. It's a period piece packed with psychos, monsters, gangsters, immortals, and told across a 200-year timeline that will always keep you guessing and wanting more. Any script would kill to have one character in their roster as well written as one of Bacchano's crew and Bacchano has over a dozen compelling individuals all under the same roof. However, even a cast as star-studded as this one has a few burnt stars within its galaxy. The narrative can be confusing, conversations run rampant without end, and the Immortals' origin story has so many big holes in it I could drive a boat show through it. 
This is a show that's received rigorous praise, but its appeal is not universal. Not everyone is going to get this show. There's a lot being presented here in a highly erratic and condensed manner, and just because people don't like it does not mean they didn't get it. Now, with that in mind, I cannot deny that when this show does do something well, it does it miraculously well. And I very much doubt that a lot of people can produce programming of this quality in such a short running time like Bacano did. Bottom line, I give Bacano 3 stars out of 5 stars. Well, that's all for now. This has been Bionic Slime for BS Reviews. Thank you all for watching and goodbye for now. <laughs> That's how you do an evil laugh. Ciao for now.